<coughs> Lord, we, we do come before you and, and bow our heart before you and are so grateful for how you have come to us this morning. Lord, we love yes. your presence. We love what you're doing. Lord God, you're doing a new thing in the midst of us, Lord. We just rejoice in that. We give thanks to you that you have given us a heart to know you. You have given us eyes to see you, and you have given us ears to hear you. And Lord, we pray that you would come and fine tune our spiritual ears to hear what you were saying to us in this hour. Lord God, as, as Ken shares, and, and Lord, the thing that you have been speaking to me this week, that we have got to obey, to love you, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our soul, with all of our being. And Lord, we are to obey you and we are to cling to you, to hold fast to you. And Lord, just as it says in Isaiah that the women came to that one man and they would not let go. And Lord, that's what we're to be. We're to be those people that come and we cling to you and we will not let go of you ever, that we will hold fast to you for you are our life, oh God. And that's what we pray, that we would really become those people that cling to our God and none other, O oh God. And we just pray that you just give us wisdom and revelation and insight into this word today that comes forth. O oh Lord, we just even ask for your assistance, for your angels, Lord God, to be here, to even assist. And yeah, our yeah. ears would be wide open and our spiritual eyes, O oh God, would be bright with the light shining within. We thank you, Lord God, for that. And we thank you for this word that you have given Ken, Lord God, about Ruth. And she clung, she clung to the, to the Lord. She clung to what you, who she saw in her mother-in-law. And Lord, we thank you for that. And we just pray that you speak through Ken, that he will be out of the way. And it will be not by power nor by might, but by the spirit of the living God. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that your word will not come back void but it will do what you said it, you've sent it to do, Lord. But let the word come forth in your power, we yes, pray in yes. Jesus' name. Yes, amen, amen, amen. Well, amen. Um, that was powerful, powerful worship uh, this morning and very powerful words and uh, that were shared uh, from the worship team and by Patricia and... Uh, it's always hard to, you know, when you've got a nice little teaching uh, to, and you have such a powerful worship. I'm trying to kind of wait on the Lord as I'm thinking here. To, you know, it, I mean, I definitely think there's some very important truths in the book of Ruth as we look at it as a type and shadow that will, uh, that will help us in terms of responding to some of the words, uh, specific Specifically, well, really both of the words that Patricia spoke and then also what Randall spoke and others as well. So, so anyway, I just want to add my prayer to Donna's. Lord, I just pray that you would show me how to flow with, with this, whether uh, to focus on certain things or to teach it as a uh, session in the Theology of the Bride class. So just emphasize what is on your heart for who will be listening to this today, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm also going to start out, I think, teaching it as, as I would as a session, and I think there's some very specific uh, aspects of this message that will be very pertinent to some of the things that were spoken uh, prophetically uh, along the way. So uh, we'll, we'll just do, do it that way. Um, this is session 12 in the Theology of the Bride class, and it's called The Bride in the Book of Ruth. And as you know, I've been looking through several types and shadows, Old Testament types and shadows that present really very important truths uh, about our pursuit of the man Christ Jesus and specifically in the context of pursuing this man Christ Jesus in the context of being a bride made ready <clears throat> for him. And then Ruth has a, a several of those very uh, important points. Uh, so we want to dig into that. I want to talk a little bit about the book and then explain the types and shadows. And then I have like seven 
seven different uh, points or pursuits uh, that as a bride uh, on the journey of making ourselves ready that we must uh, pursue uh, as we pursue Christ as a bridegroom uh, king. Uh, you know, you're, I'm sure you're probably familiar with the book of Ruth. Basically, the, uh, the book of, of Ruth, uh, there was uh, Elimelech and his two sons, uh, Chilion and uh, 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 Chilon and Malon, and his, the, his uh, Elimelech's wife Naomi, uh, and I will tell a joke here. I don't remember the uh, uh, what was this uh, Avi? What was the guy's Avi? Yeah, they, we had I had taught this years ago. I had been teaching this um, se uh, really a series on Ruth, and it would be actually better to probably if I could do it again, but I, I won't take the time to do that. But uh, I taught it, and I was using Chilion and Malion and Elimelech, and this guy Avi comes, who's a Messianic pastor who is in Israel, lived in Israel, and he was over in the States, and I don't remember how we connected with him, but he came and he taught, uh, he came for a service, Sunday service, and he said, I'm, I'm just finished teaching on Ruth, and, and like the week before, and he comes up and he says, uh, uh, I'm going to teach a message on the book of Ruth. And he goes, and he lets like, oh, I'm like, oh, I forgot about exactly how he did it, but it was like, okay, okay I, I really didn't pronounce it very good, but, uh, uh, but it was pretty, pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, but uh, back to the story. So the book of Ruth, you know the story. I'm not going to take too much time to summarize it, but uh, Elimelech and his two sons and Naomi, there was a fam they lived in Bethlehem and there was a famine in the land. And, and that's important that you, you know this as some, one of our, my later points here. There was a famine in the land. And so Elimelech took, took his family down to Moab. Uh, and there in Moab, uh, the two, uh, Elimelech died the two sons died, but before they died, they married Moabite women, Orpah uh, and Ruth. They married these Moabite women. And so then after that, they were down there, I think, about 10 years. And after that, Naomi had heard that there was no longer a famine in Bethlehem. And so she decides to go back to Bethlehem. And there was a decision on, uh, she was trying to talk Orpah and Ruth into actually staying in Moab, <clears throat> because she was saying, there's nobody for you to marry if we go back uh, to Bethlehem. And so in the story, Orpah, both of them actually initially decide to go back with Naomi, back to Bethlehem. But then Orpah uh, makes a, changes her mind and decides to stay in Moab, whereas Ruth goes with Naomi. Uh, and so she ends up, while she's in, in Bethlehem, uh, going to the fields of Boaz, uh, who is her kinsman, uh, redeem, who is her kinsman redeemer. Uh, and there's a journey there, but ultimately she ends up marrying Boaz. Ruth marries Boaz. And so uh, Ruth becomes the great grandmother through that relationship, becomes the great grandmother of King David. Uh, out of their relationship, uh, King David was, it's the line of King David. So it's a beautiful story about one who is uh, who starts their life in Moab and ends up being married to the kinsman redeemer. And of course, in a type and shadow form, and I'll go into the different types and shadows here in just a minute. But in the in type and shadow form, um, Ruth starts out in Moab follows Naomi on this journey and ends up being married in type and shadow form to Christ, who is her bridegroom, kinsman, redeemer, her bridegroom, king. And there's a beautiful, a beautiful picture, a beautiful story there. But there are several really, really important points for us to, uh, to really connect with in terms of this journey that she went on. And I think actually... Some of the points especially go right along with some of the prophetic words that were spoken uh, this morning. So anyway, that's the story. Now let me just talk a little bit about the types and shadows before I go into these seven, uh, seven points. Uh, start out with, uh, with Moab. Uh, 
Moab was a neighboring country to, uh, to Judah. Um, it, it was the way Moab was formed. When Lot left Sodom, uh, he and his two daughters went uh, and they ended up in a cave. And the two daughters were, were worried that they would not have anybody to have an inheritance with. And so they decided that they would go in and have relations with their father uh, and have a child through that relationship uh, so that they would have an inheritance. And it's kind of like a, you can't hardly imagine anybody wanting to do that, but uh, they did. Uh, and anyway, the, so the first night, uh, Lot had the relations with, they got him drunk and had relations, uh, the eldest daughter had relations with him. Uh, and from that relation, uh, Moab, the son was Moab, was born. And of course, he became the father of the Moabite uh, nation. So, uh, you know, Jeremiah talks about uh, Moab, and he says this about it. Behold, uh, behold, this is Jeremiah 9, 25, and 26. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet not un and yet uncircumcised. And he mentions Moab. Moab, and they were uncircumcised of heart. He called the people of Moab uncircumcised of heart. And so Moab, the people of Moab were some like cousins in a sense of, of, of Israel, of Judah. Uh, they, were, they practiced circumcision. The language was very uh, similar. So they were in, that, in a lot of ways similar, but their God was different. They, they, in Moab, they, uh, and this is going to be an important point here in just a minute. They, they worshiped the god Chemosh, uh, which was kind of like Molech. It was a god who, uh, false god, pagan god, who had all the pagan god practices, but, but in addition, you know, specifically requiring human sacrifice. And so the, the Moabite worship, the gods of Moab was a, was a pagan god, and the people who lived there worshiped in a pagan sense. They were circumcised as the Jews were, but yet they lived as though they were uncircumcised. And that's going to be an important point in terms of becoming a bride made ready. Uh, the Lord is going to lead us to understand that we can't, that it, we're born again, but we have to be born again in our heart. We can't, be un, we can't live uncircumcised in our heart and become the bride uh, made ready. So that's Moab. And then I'm still going through the types and shadows. Uh, Elimelech, Malon and Chilion and Bethlehem. Uh, Elimelech means my God is king. Uh, Malon means sickly. Chilion means wasting away. Uh, Bethlehem means house of bread. And so Elimelech lived in the house of bread where God is king, but he left there and not because God had led him to leave there, but because he decided, he saw a famine and he decided to leave there. And uh, because of that, uh, his family was sickly and wasted away and ended up uh, dying as well. And then we come to Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah. Uh, Naomi means pleasantness, pleasantness or delight. Uh, Orpah means stiff-necked. Uh, Ruth means friendship, comrade, and compassion. And so in this, Naomi is a picture uh, in our type and shadow. Naomi is a picture of the Holy Spirit because she is uh, leading Ruth uh, out of Moab uh, all the way to be married to her kinsman redeemer. So Naomi is a picture of the Holy Spirit, even though she's not a perfect uh, uh, person in any way, but she in our type and shadow is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Orpah is one who is stiff-necked, uh, makes a decision initially to go with Naomi, but ends up staying in Moab. Uh, and Ruth uh, is a picture of the, uh, of, of the believer who ends up being married to her kinsman redeemer, who is a picture of Christ. And so uh, Boaz then becomes a type and, and picture uh, of Christ. Um, in the notes, there's a lot more about all that. But uh, seven times in the book of Ruth, and I know this is a little tedious, but we, I need to lay this foundation. Seven times in the book of Ruth, uh, the word goel is mentioned, which is the goel, goel is an Old Testament term 
that refers to kinsman redeemer. One who was, according to the law, was at that point in time was responsible for avenging a family member that was something that was done to them or uh, purchasing their land as a, to keep their inheritance in the family. And in this case, uh, when the husband uh, died, then the kinsman redeemer had the option of, per, of uh, purchasing or, and marrying uh, the wife of the, uh, the widow of the one who had died, which is what happened here. And so he becomes the kinsman uh, redeemer of, of Ruth. Okay, so those are the types uh, in shadows. Now I want to talk about a journey, the journey of cooperation and devotion. What this, what this book shows in type and shadow form is that if we're going to become the eternal wife of Christ, we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit throughout our life in a growing devotion for Christ. There must be a growing devotion uh, for Christ. Uh, and so we're going to see several points related to that. Okay, so let's start out. First point, if we want to be, if we want to become the eternal wife of Christ, the first point is we must be determined uh, to leave Moab, determined to leave Moab, but specifically we must be determined to leave a life of worldliness and compromise and sin. We, mu that we must be determined to do that. Now, determination is not just a one-time thing. It's a, all throughout our life. We must be determined uh, to, to, live, to leave that life, of, uh, uh, th that life of compromise and that life of sin. Remember, Moab was a place where they were circumcised, but they lived as though they were uncircumcised. In other words, they lived, they were... Uh, and put it in a New Testament terms, they were born again, but they were living as though they were not born again. And so let's look at a couple of uh, points from the, the first book, the first chapter of Ruth, chapter one, verse, uh, starting with verse six, and we're not going to read all of uh, this, but there's, you know, I really would encourage you to read the whole book. There's a lot in there that we won't be able to, to read. So when Naomi was deciding to go back, uh, it says in verse 7 that she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-laws with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And so Naomi tried to talk them both out of coming with her. They said, don't, you know, don't come uh, with me because it's too hard. I don't have, there's nobody for you to marry there. There's nothing for you there. Uh, and then she said, go and return uh, uh, each of you to your mother's house. Uh, and they, in, in both, in verse 10, both of them said, and they said to her, no, uh, be, we will surely return with you uh, to your people. Both Orpah and Naomi, I mean, and Ruth said, no, we're, we're going to go with you. Both of them made a decision to go with Naomi back to Bethlehem. But then what happened In verse 14, she still tried to talk them out of it. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And then verse 15, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Remember, Chemosh was the god of Moab. She had gone back to her people and to her gods return after your sister-in-law. She's still trying to talk Ruth out of it. But then in verse 18, it says, when she, Naomi, saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, determined to go with her, she said no more. Uh, and so here's, here's, the, the, here's the point. What's, what's going on here? Um, Here's the point. Orpah and Ruth both made a decision to go back to the land and to follow, and to follow the leading of Naomi, who's a picture of the Holy Spirit. Both of them said they'd do that. 
But then Orpah changed her mind, and Ruth was determined. She was determined to leave Moab. She was determined to leave the people, her family, and the gods of Moab in order uh, to follow Naomi, who a picture of the Holy Spirit, ultimately being married to her kinsman, Redeemer. It says that she clung, uh, it says that she clung to Naomi. That word clung is the same Greek, uh, Hebrew word that's used in Genesis chapter 2, where it says, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Well, and that's the same word there. In other words, that word means to come together, uh, to be uh, actually in union uh, with, with them. And actually, it almost, it has a meaning also of actually uh, being glued to them. And so, in, in the sense of what this word is saying, it is saying that Ruth, whereas Orpah made a decision... They say, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to go, but then she ends up changing her mind and going back to her people and back to her gods, false gods. Ruth made that determination that she was going to just be one with Naomi and follow her everywhere that Naomi would lead her. In other words, everywhere the Holy Spirit would lead. And so there's, there's, a, real, uh, there's a real picture there. She, you have to be, if you want to be the bride made ready, we must be determined to leave that lifestyle, that land of compromise. We have to, we have to do it. And, you know, we live, in a, we live in a Moab type of world, don't we? But we must, in this Moab type of world, we must leave that compromise and we have to, to follow the Holy Spirit throughout our life. We must be determined to leave, leave Moab. Now, the second point uh, goes along with that. Uh, and that is a believer must be committed to follow wholeheartedly the leading of the Holy Spirit throughout their life so as to be made ready as a bride for Christ. We must be committed to follow wholeheartedly the leading of the Holy Spirit. Here's what Ruth said in this discussion with Naomi about following her. But Ruth said, do not urge me, verses verse, chapter 1, verse 16. Do not, Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Remember, Orpah went back to her people and her gods. And Ruth says, your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and, where I, and there I will be buried. And thus may the Lord, this, this sentence is important, thus may the Lord do to me and worse if anything but death parts, parts you and me. Now when she was saying that, that's covenant terminology. Uh, you know, when two people, and you know, you're familiar with this, those that have been with us for a while, when we taught on covenant, when two people, representatives of two groups, made a covenant, uh, the group would walk between the, the, the sacrificed animal, the blood on the ground, and they would, they would look at that, and they would walk between the pieces, and they would look down and say, if I violate this covenant, what has been done to this animal, let it be done to me. In other words, let me die. Let me die if I don't fulfill what I'm saying to you. That's what Ruth was saying to her. Uh, and so she makes this six-fold declaration with that type of seriousness to it. That I'm pledging my life that this is the way I'm going to live. I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to wait when you say wait. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Uh, and I'll, I'll, that's where I'll die, and that's where I'll be buried. That's the level of commitment that is there. Now, whether that's required to be born again, I'm not sure. I, I would hate to take a chance on not making that level of decision 
Because of what it says there in the end of chapter 1 is that Naomi and Ruth, they left Moab and they went to Bethlehem. It says at the beginning of the barley harvest. At the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, the barley was harvested at Passover, first fruits. Uh, wheat was harvested at Pentecost. Fruit was harvested at the tabernacles at the end. So the first, the first fruits, when, when, G, when the Jews stood at, uh, at the Passover festival, which is Passover unleavened bread and first fruits, when they stood and they waved the sheaf of grain, they were waving barley. Now, here's the point. Passover, what is Passover? The blood of the, of the animal was put over the doorpost. Uh, and, you know, salvation is when the blood of Christ is put over the doorpost of our heart. It, that Passover is a picture of the born-again relationship. And so when they're talking about going to the, to, to, back to the land at the barley harvest, they're talking about Passover which is a picture of our born-again relationship. And so that comes in the context of Ruth saying, I'll go where you go, I'll lodge where you lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. I'll die there and I'll be buried there. And if that doesn't work, if I don't, if I don't violate, you kill me. Now that sounds like, well, you put all that together, that sounds like the type of decision uh, that is needed, certainly to start the journey toward being the, the wife of Christ. That's the type of decision that must be made. And it's not just a decision, it's a determination to cooperate with the Holy Spirit throughout our life and follow him wherever he leads us for the rest of our life. That's the type of decision, a determination that we must make. It's an ongoing lifestyle, ongoing choice that we need to make. Whether that's salvation or not, I don't know. The different places in the scripture say different things. But I believe for salvation, but certainly to start the journey of bridal readiness this is the type of commitment we have to make. We have to say, Lord, I'll, I'll follow you. I'll follow the indwelling Christ, the Holy Spirit. Wherever you lead me, I will go. Whenever you say wait, I'll wait. I'll leave. You know, you start looking at these phrases. You know, wherever you go, I'll go. I'll follow you. And, you know, I mean, uh, over my life, and I know you pr you've had similar types of things, the Lord has led m me and led Donna and I into some, some of them were very easy and good decisions, and some of them were very, very challenging uh, that required us to go to the cross to make those decisions. But if you, but that's the lifestyle that leads, up, leads you to be ultimately married to your kinsman redeemer. I'll go where you go. And then the second one is I'll lodge where you lodge. And, you know, I've said this before, but it, it's not a fishing lodge. And it's not, you know, it's I'll wait where you wait. Now, th this is, I believe this is, this is from the, the, the study, but I believe it's a word for a word of knowledge as well. I'll lodge where you, I, you know, if you say wait, I'll wait. And the Lord will, you know, sometimes it seems like, okay, you are waiting, Lord, you are waiting forever. Will you ever, will you ever lead me on from this place you have me? You know, sometimes you feel that way. But look at, look at what Elimelech did. There was famine in, in Bethlehem. And Elimelech went to Moab. There's nothing in the text that says that the Lord led him to go to Moab. 
It just says he went to Moab. And what happened? He died there. His two sons died there. And Naomi was left a widow. Also, in chapter 1, when Naomi is going back to Bethlehem, what does she say? She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, Mara. And Mara means bitterness. Because I went out full and I came back empty. Now, Imelech made the decision to go on his own, not waiting on the Lord. Naomi really probably did not have the choice. So she was taken into Moab as a result of something that somebody else did to her. And she became bitter, but she, came, but she became bitter at God. It says that she was offended at God, where God had nothing to do with that decision. And I believe, I believe this is a word. I mean, it's, it's about waiting on the Lord. We need to really wait on the Lord and not get ahead of him. Especially, listen to me now, especially if things that are, we believe are, happen, are going to happen are really going to happen, if the world is going to go into greater and greater chaos, if there's going to be pressure to, to compromise our faith in order to, to enter into the systems of the world, there's going to be tremendous pressure on us not to follow God, but just to act. Act what we think will lead us to a, a better decision will lead us to, a, to, to have a solution to the problem that we face. But we better watch out. We better develop even now that lifestyle of I'm going to listen to you, Lord, whatever you say, and if you say lodge, I'm going to wait on you. Because you see what happened to Elimelech and the, and the sons, but Naomi was, was bitter and angry at God, but it wasn't because of anything God did. It was because of circumstances. The bitterness and the anger and the hurt was there, was real. But it wasn't by God. And there may be some ministry that the Lord wants to do there. We'll see. But I'll go where you go. I'll, I'll wait where you wait. And then, you know, your people will be my people. You know, we need to leave any of those relationships that ensnare us uh, into a lifestyle of compromise and sin and, you know, living as though we were living Moab. Your God will be my God. We need to get rid of those false gods, uh, idols that take priority over Christ. Most of us don't have a, uh, you know, an idol on, the, uh, on our mantle, but we, have, we may have uh, invisible idols that take us away from our pursuit of Christ. We have to get rid of those. Your God will be my God not any idols that we might have. Where you die, I will die. You know, I will go to the cross. I will allow you to lead me to the death of my self-life. You know, where you die, I will die. And there I'll be buried. I'm in this for the duration, for now. I'm doing I'm it for, for the rest of my life. This is the way I choose to live for the rest of my life. And that's important to do that. I'll run through. These others will be quicker. Uh, third, a believer must develop a lifestyle of spiritual discipline that produces favor. Uh, it, it's really interesting if, uh, and this, you know, this really kind of parallels, um, it really kind of parallels my walk for sure over the years. Uh, you know, if you look at chapter two, what happened when they got back to Bethlehem, uh, Ruth went into the fields to begin to glean uh, grain from the fields. And, and then she ultimately went to Boaz's field and, and uh, was around his maidens and all of that. But she started out, her, her first step after she got back there was to go to the fields and glean. And there, you know, that was kind of my first, when if I go back to my journey uh, you know, my initial part of, of walking with the Lord was I was just, I, I really fell in love with the scriptures. 
and I would go and glean from the, the grain of the, of the word. And I, and I loved it. And, and uh, you know, I was, th there was a kind of a, a meaning, I don't know if I intended it or not, I think I did really, uh, where I said, if I, you know, there, there's, there are principles in here that will gr give me favor with God uh, if I glean this. You know, if I tithe, it says give and it'll be given unto you. You know, God will prosper me. And I'll, you know, if I do this and I'll do this, you know, it, so there was a kind of a, 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 a discipline of that, but the point of it was to be blessed. Um, now, I, I, I do, I, my love for Christ grew during that time period, but I think for at that initial point, it wasn't so much the pursuit of the man Christ Jesus as much as the blessings of the scriptures, the blessings of the walk with God. And that's exactly what chapter 2 says. I, and I don't think that's necessarily a wrong step, but we can't stay there. We can't stay there. We've got to move on, and we'll get to that in a minute. But, you know, if you start looking uh, at that, you know, chapter 2, verse 2, Ruth said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one who, in whose sight I might find favor. See, she's looking for favor. Um, and as she does that, I mean, Boaz in verse 5, Boaz begins to, uh, to, to recognize her. She, she raises up above the, the, the life of some of the others. And he says, whose young woman is this? You know, we begin to catch God's attention. So getting into the scriptures and getting into the disciplines of the Lord uh, is a very, uh, um, very important, uh, very important concept. We catch God's attention. Uh, then she came and, uh, and she remained from the morning until now. And uh, not rushing, not just trying to get a scripture of the day kind of a thing, but waiting. I know, and I know our lifestyles are different and busy and all this, but just to uh, just to take time and allow God to, to minister uh, in whatever way uh, we can. Uh, and so you, anyway, she goes on and she gets into the word and then uh, she stays in fellowship with the maidens, uh, you know, Boaz's maids. Um, when she was thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. You know, drink of the Holy Spirit. So she she had this discipline to go to the Word, uh, hang out with those who were in the fields with her, uh, drink of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it says also in chapter 2, it says, May the Lord reward your work. There's, a, there's a reward for that, earthly favor and a reward, even an eternal reward there. And then in verse 16, also you shall purposely pull out for her some grain from the bundles and leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So her work produced her study, her her walking in the disciplines of the Lord produced, produced a measure of favor and had her stand out with her bridegroom king. But then, in addition to that, Boaz had, had the, his servants pull out bundles of grain and give it to her. And so there, there's, you know, there's stuff that comes from your own diligence. But there's other things that come because of your diligence, he just said, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to open up heaven. I'm going to give you revelation and insight and knowledge of things that you had no idea about. You studied, you studied, you studied, but then, bam, I'm going to give you this over here. But, that, but all that comes of, a, of developing that walk of abiding and connecting and seeking uh, the Lord. That's the uh, that's the third point. The fourth one, a believer must pursue the man Christ Jesus above his provision. This is important. 
A believer must pursue the man Christ Jesus above his provision. If you look at, so you look at chapter one, it's the decision to go. You look at chapter two, it's the lifestyle of the disciplines of the Lord. But then in chapter three, there's a shift. Naomi says, okay, you've worked in the fields, but you need the security of the relationship with this man, Boaz. And so that's where, it, that's a huge, huge shift that needs to take place in every believer's life. You have to come to that point where, yes, I love the provision. I love the favor. I love the revelation of the scriptures. I love the teaching insights. But I want this man, this man Christ Jesus, the person of Christ, more than the favor and the blessing of the Lord. I want the, the, the joy of the connection with Christ. I want the joy uh, uh, of just the, of hearing his voice. It may, it may have nothing to do with provision or favor or any kind of blessing. Just to hear the voice of this man, to feel his presence, to encounter him, to enjoy him, this man. And it's a huge, it's a huge transition. I remember it's, it's been years and years ago when the Lord began, just spoke to me and I was enjoying studying the word and it was almost like the Holy Spirit said, but you don't really love this man Christ. You, you love the scriptures. You love what it provides for you. You love the blessings of all that. But you don't love this man, Christ Jesus. And I don't think the Lord meant that I don't, didn't love him at all. But what he was saying is that you need to put this man, Christ, the person of Christ, above the blessings of following God. It's a huge decision, transition, but it must be made by each and every one of us. That was the fourth one. Now, the fifth point uh, is that a believer must pursue Christ as our bridegroom. You, we, we pursue this man, Christ Jesus, but we want to pursue him also with a specific bent toward pursuing him, pursuing him as, as our bridegroom. Very important. Very important that we... Now, I, I know that there are a lot of people who will be the eternal bride of Christ without ever having, knowing that there was a bride because they pursued the man. But there's a, there is a really important aspect of realizing Christ is going to have a bride and the bride must be made ready. And I want to pursue this man in order and for the purpose of becoming his eternal bride or his eternal wife. There's a, there's a revelation needed uh, in our hearts for that. For, you know, Naomi says to him, you, you go to where he is. He's at the threshing floor at the end of the harvest. He's at the threshing floor. You go and you lay at his feet. She was pursuing him at that point to be her husband. She wanted uh, him to redeem her as his bride. And so she went to that. And we need, we, we need to go to Christ. We need that revelation of pursuing him as a bridegroom. Sixth point, which goes along with that, is that a believer must actively make himself or herself ready as a bride for Christ. If you look at chapter 3, verse 3, Naomi said uh, to Ruth, in terms of going to him, wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. And she said, all that you say, I will do. All that you say, I will do. Now, Naomi is telling Ruth, the Holy Spirit is telling the bride, the betrothed bride, wash yourself, cleanse yourself. Now, of course, we're talking spiritually. Cleanse yourself, anoint yourself, put on your bridal garments, 
and go to the threshing floor, because that's where you're going to meet. That's where we meet Christ as bridegroom king, at the threshing floor. Now, the threshing floor, I, I'm sure you know what it is, but it was just a, at that point in time, just a hard rock or whatever, and the grain was put on there, and it was beaten, uh, and because after, out of the beating, the, the wheat or the, the, the grain was separated from the chaff. Uh, and it's a great picture, not a necessarily a pleasant one, but a great picture of the bride uh, going to the cross, separating the wheat, the, 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 the spirit, from the flesh, the chaff being the flesh. Uh, that's where we meet him, and so we have to go there. But there's an active, in, there's an active focus that needs to be made on this that we, we say, you know, we need to realize, Lord, I need to wash my garments. I need to put on bridal garments. I need to have the anointing uh, of the Holy Spirit uh, to be upon me. I need to say to the Holy Spirit, all you say, as you lead me step by step, I will go where you go, where you say go. And then the seventh one, a believer must trust that by fully cooperating with the Holy Spirit, they will be selected as an eternal wife for Christ. Uh, you know, after Ruth did all this, she went to the threshing floor, she laid at his feet, uh, he recognized her, and he, uh, in this case, he had to go to the gate, which where the elders made their decisions. He had to go to the gate of the city and uh, get permission to redeem her uh, as his wife. Now, there was, you know, if you look at the, the text there, there was another relative who was actually closer uh, and had first uh, responsibility to be the kinsman redeemer. But that one was unable to do it. Probably a picture of Adam. You know, Adam couldn't redeem her, uh, but Christ could. And so he got the, he got the approval uh, to do it. He was able to. He had the wealth and the ability to do it. Uh, he was the only one who had that. Uh, and so he took her as his wife. And, of course, you know that out of their relationship, uh, King David uh, came through the line. Uh, uh, that line, King David, was born uh, of that. Uh, for us... We, we do all we can, and when I say we do all, it's all led of the Holy Spirit, being obedient, uh, you know, the whole process that Brian's talking about with the indwelling life. It's all as the Holy Spirit leads, and we say, if we cooperate with the leading of the Holy Spirit, where he takes us to the cross, and some of that we don't necessarily cooperate, it's just this is what he does in us, it kind of beats away the chaff uh, from, a, from our lives. When we do this, we're making ourselves ready. We have to trust. Lord, I'm, I'm, do, I'm pursuing all this. Make me, I want to be the, your eternal bride. I want to rule and reign with you for all throughout eternity. I want to, I want to be that Zadok priest that, uh, that worships as a pillar in the temple, uh, the New Jerusalem. I want to be all those things. And I can't really do it. But when you go to the gate, I ask that you would get, that I would be permitted to be your wife, eternal wife of Christ. So there's a journey. And I want us to realize there is a journey. It's, it's in the New Testament. It's a thread that runs from Genesis all the way to Revelation of the bridal journey. And it is a journey that we must cooperate with. We can't make it happen, but we must actively cooperate with the Holy Spirit in order to end up in that place of being the bride made ready. Let us all, let us all jump into that journey and not be like Orpah who made a decision to do it but then never actually left Moab.
Let us be like Ruth, who made a decision, but she also had a determination and entered into a covenant level commitment to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit throughout her life and ultimately became the eternal wife of her Boaz, of her kinsman, Redeemer. Let it be for us. Amen? Amen. Yeah, let's just stand up and uh, pray. And Father, we, we ask for the work of the Holy Spirit to be released over us, in us and through us, to make us ready. Make us ready, Lord. Lord, I just do for my own life. I, I recommit my life to that sixfold declaration that Ruth made, that I'll go where you go, I'll lodge where you lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you go, I will die. Where you die, I will die. And where you are buried, I will be buried. Help it be our decision, our commitment, and to follow you all the days of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.